um, could you tell us a little bit about Cerulean in terms of the company and particularly your uh, innovation stories? Okay. Cerulean is a market leader in electronic instrumentation for the tobacco industry and specialised tube packing equipment. It's been around for about 40 years. It has a long history of incremental product improvement and indeed the QTM, the quality test module, has been its core product for about 10 to 15 years. About four or five years ago we got to the point where it was clear that that product was starting to run out of steam. Um, we had been very good at incrementing that, improving it. It had several relaunches over the course of, of the 10 to 15 years. But we felt that we wanted to move beyond that. We wanted something new, something different. And we then set about how we were going to create product that was different from what had gone before. And that's what resulted in the, the innovation project. Oh, that's interesting. And um, that isn't to the exception of uh, inverted commas steady state innovation. You still keep on a regular program of incremental innovation. The, the way we saw it was the incremental will run in the background. We're good at that. We didn't need to do an awful lot of work with it. We had taken steps to improve our new product introduction process. We had stage kit um, project management. We review projects. Uh, we have a review process right at the beginning to look at new products. We review them at each stage. If necessary, some of them get killed along the way. Um, we track costs, we track product costs, we track project cost. So it's, it's fairly well managed. And that, if you like, was the, the underlying project management that, that we had built up. What we wanted to do was to create something that sat on top of that. Perhaps distinct, perhaps running separately, or perhaps slightly interwoven with it, that would allow us to do, do different projects, that would allow us to create projects that weren't an enhancement of what had gone before, but were something new, either coming from outside or coming from internal ideas. We had tried that once in the past, about seven, eight years ago, and the idea came from us going to an outside consultancy. I'm paying a substantial amount of money for an idea that really should have come from within the company. All the consultancy did was talk to different people, play back those ideas in a form that here's a suitable product. And I felt that we've got the raw materials, we've got the fuel for the, the product ideas within the business. We just need a mechanism to focus that, to bring it to fruition as a project proposal. And the the radical project, the radical innovation project, came from that. It, it wasn't intended to replace incremental, it was intended to, as I say, either sit alongside on top or loosely interwoven with it. There was a feeling, I think, initially that we could plug them both into the same process and get a common output, but that quickly became apparent that that wasn't going to work. So in a sense you've got a problem with trying to create two different cultures, the one that's there supporting incremental innovation and a new one which, as you say, may sit alongside, may be a little separate, which is about doing something rather different. Yeah. Um, can you do it with the same people? Yes, you can. Um, those people have to be managed in a way that allows them to do things differently. One thing we didn't want to do was to lose our ability to do the incremental. We had continuous improvement, we had continuous development of our projects, our products, and we wanted to retain that. But at the same time, we wanted to be able to, to use that group of people to take ideas that had come from ideas within the company, ideas from outside, perhaps outside the industry, and say, right, here's a suitable product. Um, we didn't want to create something that sat outside. It would have been nice, but we're not big enough to have a, a skunk works. Um, also, we felt that if it was too remote, it became too detached. Um, we're not in a position where we can do speculative development that might lead to something six or seven years down the road. We're a small business, we're relatively profitable, we need to retain that profitability. And to retain that momentum, we needed this additional feature of two different products starting to flow through. We needed to revitalize the company and regain the, the reputation we had for being a, an innovation company. You've described how the incremental, the steady state system works. You have a portfolio, you have a stage gate system, you have the classic tools of innovation management. Um, you also described this, this new culture, this new system for the more radical. Um, 
very briefly, could you tell us how that works? How do you search for perhaps the slightly unexpected? How do you choose some perhaps slightly different ideas to the mm. ones you're normally used to allocating resources to? And how do you carry them forward inside the same company alongside some more traditional incremental projects? Okay. We look in the usual places for our industry. We look at our customers, we look at our suppliers, we go to trade bodies, we go to trade fairs, we present technical papers. We have an input coming from our customers. What we've also tried to do is to develop inputs from other areas. Um, we've done that in a number of ways. We, where we're recruiting, we try to bring in people who can bring a different perspective. We don't necessarily want people who have worked in the type of instruments we have in the same industry. We have, and certainly in the past, we have brought in people who bring a completely different perspective, almost like introducing the grain of sand into the oyster. We deliberately look outside. We will look in other areas. We will look in areas that are perhaps a different technology. We will look in areas that are adjacent to, to what we do, where we haven't normally looked. Um, and what we also do is encourage the, the employees themselves to come forward with ideas. Um, some of our product ideas have come from an individual who was sitting as, as part of, or a peripheral part of a, a little project team that was looking at do different project ideas or do different products for the future of the business. He had an idea, he created something in his garage, he brought it in to me and says, what about this? And we looked at it, we had a quick discussion about it, um, talked to the management team and initiated a development that we did with one of our suppliers. And that came right from outside an area we normally operate in. It came through one of our employees, long service employee, so not someone who was recent to the business. But it was triggered by him thinking in a way that I think we've taken the constraints away, we've taken the barriers away, and all of a sudden he can think further, broader, beyond where he has traditionally thought. And an idea has come that he has married up to a potential market need because of the job he worked in uh, when he was working in the, the service repair area. He says, right, there's an opportunity for this product. Here's how we could do that. He created a prototype out of a piece of drain pipe and some pieces he had taken from the repair area and says, here's a functional model, what about this? And from that we actually created a, a, a product that has spawned a product range of small manual instruments that traditionally the business hasn't been involved with for probably 20 years. And that is an idea that came from within the business, it came from an existing employee but it's not something that we would have thought of as, as part of our normal pipeline. We had nothing that we could take, we could incrementally improve. We didn't immediately see, oh, there's a demand for this, let's do that. This came from him having some local knowledge and talking to customers at a lower level and saying, there's actually a demand for this small product. It's small, it's relatively niche, it's not going to set the world alight, but it enhances our product range and it puts us into an area where I've never been before. So we're, we're very receptive to those ideas coming forward. We, we create an environment where we encourage people to question and challenge. We've actually got an appraisal system where we, we look at people's competencies rather than performance. And one of the competencies we want is, is that person willing to question and challenge? Are they willing to, to say, well, how can we do this better? How can we do this more effectively? So the continuous improvement is, is something we look for. But we also want people to, to hold up their hands and say, hang on a minute, why are you doing it that way? Mm -hmm. What about this? I've seen this because of something I've done, one of my hobbies, or in some of the social activities. We've talked about this. What about this? And we encourage people to bring those ideas in and work with us to, to develop that into a product idea. Um, we've actually set up a mechanism where we, we run project team where we take people from all areas of the business, this is no longer just the product development area, um, we then put them in a room with whatever resources they need for three or four days and say what we want out of this is a number of product ideas that are different to what we do. Where could we go in the future? Where could we take this little business? Working within the limits of what we're capable of, yeah we could design an aeroplane, we struggle to build it, we're not <laughs> really set up for that, but smaller products, the, the, the type of thing that they're comfortable with, uh, 
perhaps as a hobby, perhaps as a personal interest. They, they, they bring that and they will come up with product ideas. And the last one that we ran, we had seven or eight product ideas came out, ranging from, well, here's an application for this particular industry, it was tube packing. It, it, it was taking some of the concepts of instrumentation from the instrument side of the business to say, well, we could use that principle to measure tubes, both cylindrical, cigarettes and filters, cylindrical tubes are cylindrical, so we could use the same mechanism to test for tubes. That's, if you like, at the more incremental end. At the, the radical end, we had some ideas coming for software tools and software development, completely different to anything we would normally operate in. We have a question now, do, do we want to take this and work with this, or could we sell this idea to someone else? But for, for me, the big advantage of this is we're generating ideas. We're not saying, no, we can't think of that. We're actually opening it up and drawing more and more out. And I, I think that the next time we run it, we'll probably get a broader range and perhaps more bizarre ideas coming out. And we're finding that not everybody does it. Certain people prefer to have the incremental. Other people like to be able to, to go in and question and challenge and say, well, what about this? How radical can I be? And because we encourage it, because we encourage them to, to question what we do, we, we want them to try things. We want them to say, okay, well, if it doesn't work, what have we learned from that? No, okay, it doesn't work, we're not going there. Mm. Which is creating that different stream of thought, that subculture, if you like, that is so different to the incremental where you want continuous improvement. There has to be a, an incremental and there has to be a demand for it. Otherwise, you don't do it. And doing a whole project management selection follow through is, is is this product going to deliver sufficient margin and sufficient volume and are the costs controlled? With the, the more radical products, that clearly doesn't work. So we, we have to take something that's slightly looser. We will still try and do an evaluation. Um, we did a very back of the fag packet, if you like, evaluation <laughs> for for the little manual instrument. Um, and what we did was we, we did a quick poll of some customers and we found, yeah, there is actually a demand. It's not huge and it's, it, it's niche, if you like, within a niche, but there's a demand there. And that gave us the encouragement that, yes, we, we, we can go for this, we can do this. Um, we deliberately didn't develop it internally. Um, we deliberately allowed this individual to project manage with an external supplier so that it was given if you like its own identity, its own momentum, and we wouldn't contaminate it with our incremental do better approach. Um, it happened as a parallel stream, we brought it in, it came in on budget on time, um, and I think that has ha acted as an example mm -hmm. to the other people in the company, saying, yeah, this is good. There was a little bit of recognition and reward, we made a presentation of the quarterly briefing, we gave them some of money, was particularly much as one or two thousand pounds as a recognition for for doing this, and all of these things are encouraging the individuals to to push a little bit harder to to think of what could we do. Here's an idea. No one's going to shoot me down for thinking this is stupid because they've been after ideas. So I'll put this forward, and that is slowly building up as as a subculture, not across the whole company, but there there there's a if you like, a group of people that think in that way. And it's almost creating the conditions to allow those people to, to flourish, to grow out beyond. Those people are still involved in their normal projects, their incremental projects. But what they can also do as, as an additional activity is engage in this more creative side, this do different side, which allows them an opportunity to extend what they would normally do. They like it, we get the product flow, the product ideas coming through. We're still at the early stages of, of trying to do something with those product ideas. That's a lovely story. Um, and it really, I think, exemplifies how you can get a huge number of ideas from within if you mobilise everybody's mm -hmm. brains in the process. Um, there is a sort of corollary to that, though, which is a very topical theme, which is sometimes called open innovation. And the premise is not all the smart people work for us. Even if you're a giant mm -hmm. firm, <coughs> Procter & Gamble, you still can't cover all the bases. So in a world where there's masses of knowledge being created outside, not just R&D, but market knowledge, what competitors do, in a sense there's lots going on out there as well as mm -hmm. the ideas in-house. 
how do you tap in in this open innovation world? How do you pick up stuff that's out there? We open up, if you like, we open up the world to those people. We say, where do you want to look? Where do you want to go? Do you want to go to different exhibitions? And we, we've had people making requests, I want to go to this exhibition, I want to go to the obvious ones, sensor and vision, but also going to, to things that are vaguely associated with what we do, but step them out into another environment. We, we, we certainly encourage ideas from our customers. Um, not so much the, the users of our product, but the people involved at the R&D side um, are talking about what might be coming up in the future. It would be good if we had one of these and we could measure that, and then that triggers an idea for a, a development. Um, we actively look outside, we, we, we seek out new areas t t to go and experience. We will go on visits to other companies, for example. We, not so much in the last six or nine months, but certainly up to that we had a regular group, not a regular group of people, but a regular event where we would go out, different people would go out to another company and look at what they do. Um, this is not just product development, this is how do they operate, what can we learn from them. So a form of, if you like, loose benchmarking. But what that does is if those people are involved in the development side, looking at new products, thinking about where there may be opportunities, both product development and salespeople, they may see something that, that comes back that creates an idea. What we're not good at yet is amassing that knowledge and storing it. It tends to be held in, if you like, hard format, documents, pamphlets, <coughs> website addresses and in people's knowledge. But it's turned over regularly, it's discussed regularly. Mm -hmm. um, we have a little library area, I suppose you could call it, where there are lots of general magazines, technical scientific magazines, and the trade magazines. And people can go in there and, and research something, they can look at something. We have access to the internet for virtually everybody in the company. And it's left fairly open to them. They, they, they're allowed to go and search for things that they may think is important and bring those ideas in from outside. I think the best way to describe it is that if there's a source of ideas, we'll look at it and we'll try and tap into it. We certainly don't claim to have a very formal system for doing it, but what we have done is, is create a culture where people are more than happy to go and look. They don't feel embarrassed about going and doing some speculative research by visiting a customer visiting a supplier by talking to another company, by sitting, surfing the internet. We allow them time to do that, give them the resource to do it, we encourage them to do it. And that tends to bring the art that was possible uh, and in a broader arena in t to, if you like, a pool that we can then work with. I mean, that, that, that sounds tremendous uh, and, and clearly it's a system that's working, people buy into. And it delivers results. Yes. The company's profitable, it's growing through innovation, not just by doing the same thing. Um, but then that sort of raises some questions which are around strategic management, which is the horizon. So perhaps could I ask you now where you see, let's say, the, the top two or three challenges, the things that you're losing sleep over perhaps, you're worrying about or you can see coming and you will be worrying about in the future. Where are the future innovation management challenges? I think there's probably two parts to that. There is the, the product. Where is the, the demand going to be in the future in a very regulatory environment? It's difficult to see which, which direction it's going to be. And the, the tobacco industry is becoming extremely regulated. Um, some of the things that they're beginning to measure for research purposes are very much off, way off what we traditionally measure. So it, it, it's knowing where those demands are likely to be in the future. It's staying abreast of the regulatory people, World Health Organization, ISO, the standard people, to understand where their thinking is, not where they are and what the current standards are, but what, what's the current topic around the coffee machine? What's likely to happen? Where's the political direction likely to take this? So what do we need to be thinking of in terms of measurement in the future? So where we want to be in five years time in terms of products there's always a nervousness 
can we see it before anybody else does? Can we can we then respond quickly enough? So the, the second part of it, having identified what that area is, yeah, that's that's what's going to go. How do we develop that? Um, how do we develop a product for which there's no standard written and which some of the customers um, probably have no interest at all in measuring because it's no longer it's not yet a regulatory requirement. Um, the second part is probably easier, I think, because of the, the, the culture we have now. We have people who are much more open-minded, much broader thinking. Um, we no longer take what we've got and just automatically increment it. We'll look at doing that, but we'll also say, well, is there a better way of doing this? Can we leapfrog the next incremental step and produce something that is significantly better by using a different technology, by using a different method. The, the bigger concern I probably have is, is identifying, well, what's that, what's that area going to be? What is that demand? Where's it going to come from? Is it actually going to be from our current customers? Is it going to be from someone else? And if you think in terms of, well, we produce instruments, support instruments, Customers don't buy instruments. They want information about their process. So it's the product for the future, selling them data on their process as a service, if you like, rather than us selling them an instrument. Because they only use an instrument because they have to. The technical director calls it a distressed purchase. They buy it because they have to. They have to measure this. No one chooses an instrument in that environment because they, they like it, because it looks pretty, or because there's any benefit. There's a slight movement down the road of improving process capability and improving material utilisation, but the vast majority of customers use it because it's regulatory. It has to be there. And if you, if you then think further ahead, well, in a regulatory environment, it's not actually the instrument they want. It's information about compliance. And is that our product for the future? Mm -hmm. Do we get to the stage where we will install in a process line or instrumentation and we will sell to the customer information about their process pulled off per byte, pulled off per hour, pulled off per measurement in whatever form. It's a subject that's actually begun some discussion with one of the bigger multinationals. That thinking is already there. It certainly creates a lot of discussion within Cerulean. We have half an eye on that as a potential product line in the future where we're, se we're selling data, not actually selling hardware and therefore how would we operate? Um, very basic level or statement of requirements for our new product project, how would that look if we we're going to produce data as an output? Um, there are other models about where companies lease products to people. The one that is in the back of my mind is wheelie bins, nobody buys wheelie bins, they're leased from those companies and the business is, generates its margin from maintenance and supply and replacement of the wheelie bins. So there are other models we can use to do that but we've got half an eye on well, the products of the future are not necessarily the little blue boxes that we currently sell. I think that's, that's a very interesting theme because it's, it's got an awful label but it's loosely called serviceization and increasingly uh, a company like Rolls-Royce makes more money from those services mm. wrapped around its engines than the actual aircraft engines it makes as a product. Um, the challenge which I think you've started to identify though is how do you make the change when you might need very different skills, you almost certainly need to build different relationships, you may need to get to different parts of your client organisations to the ones you're traditionally dealing with. Uh, any thoughts around that? Oh yes, lots. <laughs> um, overcoming the inertia with the customers would be the biggest issue. They're, they're thinking, particularly when you're dealing with procurement people, is and we are acquiring this box and this traditionally is the cost of acquiring it. The more advanced view as well, this is the life cycle cost. So, are you going to buy data? Oh, well, that's cheap then. So you supply the instrument, the data is cheap, and the, the whole cost, modelling of the cost, is, is an issue. You're quite right, it's, it's different people you're dealing with. Um, the, the people that will be users of our instrumentation are production operators, um, quality assurance people, and in some cases laboratory people. 
um, for the light regulatory requirement, are they really going to be the users of it, or, or, or is it perhaps more pushed towards the regulatory side and the regulatory bodies themselves? Um, we don't have any answers yet, but the thinking is there, the discussion happens, well, particularly when we're doing a strategic product review and talking about well, what's the future four years, five years from now, what are the type of products we could be looking at. That is tending to come up as, as something that we're aware of. We know we're going to have to begin to work with it at some point because one of the major multinationals will eventually end up pushing us down this road. We know it will be slow because the multinationals have their own inertia and we have the leading lights and the people pushing the boundaries in there are going to be restrained by the more traditional people. And there's, there's a tension between the people who want to maintain what they've got and the people who want to step onto something new. It's, just, it's at a point of discussion, really, at this stage. Um, we're aware of it, we're very open to how we will work with it. We know of other models where that type of thing has happened, but we're not yet at the point. We know we'll have to get there. Maybe it's five years, maybe it's ten years. But I think it's fairly certain that it will move a long way down that road. It may only be that the company would lease the instrument from us for a period of time, the wheelie bin scenario. It may never go to fully just buying data. But we have some simple models on how we would do that. We do a little bit of limited leasing to some companies where they struggle to get the money for capital expenditure. We'll put a leasing package to them. So we, we have a peripheral knowledge of that. Um, so the, the thinking is there at this stage. It's still very, very embryonic. It's a, a very good illustration of innovation as a dynamic capability. It's not just being able to manage it mm -hmm. for one steady state set of conditions. The world changes and you've talked about product innovation, uh, process innovation, and there you're really talking about rethinking the whole business model from being mm -hmm. a manufacturer yeah. to being a service company. That raises the question though of, of learning to build capability and clearly talking to you it's a company that's learned and you yourself have learned a lot of lessons about innovation. Um, difficult question but if I ask you to think back what are the two or three really big lessons you've learned about managing innovation? The key lessons are around people. Um, Cerulean is a, is a company that relies on its people's capabilities. We have no processes as such. We use our supply chain to provide the sensor technology. We put it together, we have the software. So our business planning or our disaster recovery is all focused around what happens if we have an issue with people. And what I find is in, in making that change, creating that capability to, to think differently, to, to do the radical innovation, People's ability to adapt to that, to modify, is incredibly complex. It's different approaches for different people. We have people that we thought very stuck in the mud, they're never going to change, actually coming forward with some fantastic ideas. We have brought people in as a planned approach to, to say, right, this is a this is an individual who's going to stir things up. They think completely differently. They're very outspoken. They're, push their ideas forward, they, they're certainly not going to fit in. And we have deliberately recruited people with a different character set, and it hasn't worked. We've, we've found that they haven't fitted in, and if anything, they have begun to adopt the incremental approach. Which is, the whole reason for bringing them in was that they didn't just fit in and adopt the incremental approach. So how you gauge that at the beginning is still something that we're not sure of. The other thing I think that's uh, uh, the next stage on from that in changing the people that you have. It's not a simple, okay, today we're doing radical and they'll just change. They diffuse into it and they need encouragement. That encouragement has to come from the whole management team. They have to walk the talk very much and it has to be seen to be something important. This cannot be something we'll do on Friday afternoons when we're not doing anything else. Mm -hmm.